Okay, welcome to this um, session. I think it must be the last of the day. It's been a long day. I've been um, a bit, you know, rushing up and, you know, rushing around and having problems with uh, my system. But fortunately, I've arrived just on time for you to have a chair to chair your session. Um, the way it's going to work is the different experiences will be presented one after the other. The idea is to have them about 10 minutes each. And then that should come up to about half an hour. And then open to, to the public and everybody for questions and answers, which should take us um, another, another, 30, another 30 minutes, hopefully. And that will cover the whole hour we have in front of us. Um, the first uh, bit, so to speak, is the CVAL note which I gather has to do with uh, universities and research centers and uh, supporting the territorial impact of the universities and research centers in Chile. And Etienne is gonna present this. So I'll give you the floor and um, then you have 10 minutes. Oh, I'll count. I don't know how I'm gonna make noises and tell you that the time is over, but I'll, you know, I'll, tr I'll try to make myself present when the 10 minutes come, come about. Thanks, Etienne, please. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I will share my screen uh, for the presentation of the Not Cival. This is a consortium of say in Chile. The 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 name of the, the presentation is the Cival Node. I'm from Chile in South America. Um, the title of the presentation is Accelerating the Territorial Impact of Science, Technology, Knowledge, Innovation from a Regional or Local Level Perspective. Uh, my name is Etienne Chopé and I'm director of this consortium. Um, ah, I think it's, it's okay, the, the view of the presentation. Can someone tell me? But I will say, I will continue. It's okay, huh? Let me say, let me bear again. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, I would like to say that uh, what are the Chilean notes? The the Chilean notes is a it's a program uh, related to the public policy in Chile. And this is a, it's a new program from last year. It's a program funded by the, the national and the main agency for research and development in Chile. Right now are five, currently are five Chilean nodes are participating in this new program called Nodes for the Acceleration of Territorial Impact of Science and Technology, Knowledge and Innovation. And I would like to say that this is the first time that from the, from the, from the government, on, on, in principle, from related to the Ministry of Science and Technology in Chile, that uh, this is a new policy, is a new public policy that uh, is um, right now currently by main by actors, local actors in regions of Chile. In Chile, we have 15 uh, regions, so we have right now these five Chilean nodes. The main objectives that we are working right now is uh, to identify gaps that limit, limit uh, scientific de development and technology and innovation in these 15 Chilean regions. Of course, to establish priority areas of research and development at local, at local level. This is the first time I say that local actors are dreaming or are well, thinking about our own future and to design a roadmap to articulate the different regional actors. There is a lack of trust and collaboration in Chile. So there is a need to link all the different actors from private, public universities and research centers. And the, the, the dream is how can we link capacities or competences of research and development with opportunities, problems, or challenges in universities, research centers, companies, and of course, uh, society, our citizens. This is our, our, our final dream. I would like to say that this is a, a special 
new public policy in Chile. The, the, the notes, the, the notes program uh, has different values. We are, we are talking about the dialogue, different actors. How can we collaborate closely together? How can we create uh, different networks um, at, at local level? And how can we create, of course, social capital? There is a lot of, 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 of trust, a lot of trust in Chile. And this is the voice of local actors, especially from academy companies. That is always something very difficult to know how, uh, what are demanding the, the companies related to research and de development, and of course the society. This is the civil node. This is the the, the node related to the macro zona centro. That that's the region of Coquimbo and Valparaíso, and is composed by uh, five universities. Uh, and three research centers, especially centers related to food, uh, neurociencia, and of course, related to water, um, water resources. Uh, what we have done, this is, a, is a, as a consortium of two different, two years. Last year, we did a methodological design. We, re, we collect primary information and review, of course, secondary information related to, to related uh, reviews or studies before uh, before last year. Uh, we did survey, survey, survey with regional stakeholders uh, from academia, from companies, from citizen, and uh, of course, universities and research centers. We um, purified different research and development areas, especially from this node. We are working right now in water resources, biodiversity, and foods. Of course, we have different virtual and last year after the final months of, of last year, a uh, workshops in person to know what are the proposals for the, the identified gaps of the local ecosystem. We validate the with uh, experts these gaps proposal and challenges. And of course, we did qualitative interviews. So right now we are in the middle of this consortium. We are uh, trying to implement uh, a roadmap for, for this year. And where the, we are working right now in four different dimensions. One is how can we strengthen the human capital more related to needs from companies, research, especially applied research and technological development. How can we uh, work together with companies, work close together with companies related to research and development and innovation? And of course, something very difficult is how can we hear the voice from society and to, to engage with them and with their needs related to uh, innovation and of course, research and, and development. So we identify gaps and we have right now different proposals. Uh, well, well, the the first the the main gaps that we identify that there is a need to link universities and research centers more efficiently with private sector companies to know what are are demanding. This is something very important for us. How can we to promote different internships of researchers of and of course uh, undergraduate students in companies to help them to solve their problems? How can we generate new programs undergraduate and postgraduate programs to retain talent in, at the local level and region? And how can we to promote the creation of undergraduate and postgraduate programs linked to the needs of companies? But first of all, we have to, to know what are the needs of companies. And something very important for us is how can we create a new program to promote public trust in science, technology, knowledge, and innovation with citizens. Something, something very special for us because right now, as you know, we are in the middle of a, a new political moment in Chile that is very focused on how can we work at local level more than in the capital as, as before in, in all in Santiago. This is our main challenge for this new for this year is how can we implement a pilot program how can we to we work together as universities and research centers in the in the node this is the name science and Ter territory program uh, work how can we work uh, closely together better with companies to create a network with companies with professionals related to research and innovation and how can we um, help the citizenship uh, to to believe and to trust in science and, and innovation. So this there is a this is a huge program 
uh, uh, a lack of trust and collaboration. So we have to move forward. How can we strengthen the, the basis of uh, or the foundation of this node work together with companies and with citizens? So we, why we are here, especially, of course, we, we I would like to congratulate all the organization of this uh, conference, but the, the special, uh, I, we are here because we want to know more about similar international experiences to improve our work, uh, our work, uh, especially at local level, because as, you, as I say, I, we are in Chile, it's very different from Europe or North America. Uh, so uh, we are right now at the beginning of implementing this new public policy related to innovation and research and development. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you especially for keeping to the time so closely. You know, it's like you had a clock that was 10 minutes on the spot almost. So thank you very much. I'll now give the word to Alejandra, who is going to present um, the, the factor, I guess, a very different kind of thing that has to do with uh, urban regeneration programs. So Alejandra, please, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, so today, as you mentioned, I will be presenting some of the work that we do at the T-Factor project, which is a Horizon 2020 action. Um, the topics that I will be going over in these 10 minutes um, have to do with one of the pilots that we work with uh, in Bilbao, Isla Zorrotzaure, which is uh, one of the largest um, regeneration projects happening in Bilbao in the, in the most recent years. Um, so as an introduction, the T-Factor project um, is a cohort of research where we employ the waiting time of urban regeneration processes to transform society in a way that enables it to, to tackle the the challenges that we are faced with in the context of climate change, sociopolitical shifts, and things of the sort. So one of the the primary goals that we have at T Factor is to rethink the way that we make cities and to tweak urban regeneration models and tools uh, to help cities keep up the pace with these challenges. And we do so by prototyping um, urban interventions in the meanwhile. So in the waiting time where this urban regeneration processes happen. In this waiting time, we develop knowledge, tools, and prototypes that help cities create temporary uses for that specific regeneration process, but then also that enables them to later on um, go forth with the knowledge and the know-how to replicate uh, some of the transformations that happen within this waiting time. Uh, the D-Factor project works with six pilot cities, which you can see in the screen. The purple ones are our pilot cities, and the red ones, uh, we call them advanced case studies. So I'm actually based in Dortmund, one of the advanced case study cities that mentor and help the pilot cities uh, go forward in their urban regeneration process and helps them um, integrate temporary uses as part of their strategy. The uh, background of the experiment that I am, will be talking to you about shortly in Bilbao um, is grounded in three levels, and these three levels are also permeated the whole of the, of the T-Factor project. Um, the mission level, which is where we found the meanwhile activities on the ground, the pilot level, so um, this deals with the master plan, the regeneration project as a whole, the site, uh, the city. And then we have a transnational level that um, is where we find um, the generation of knowledge, practices, and capacities. This is the part where, where the project sort of leaps out of the context and, and uh, spills over this um, generated know-how. Um, so one of the ways that we we tackle this level of complexity is by um, at the ground level we have t uh, seven um, transformation labs we call them and they're split into seven different um, thema um thematic lines 
which you can see in the screen. Um, one of them is arts and culture, urban production and dig digitalization, smartness, um, urban design for sociality and well-being, circular economy, social innovation and inclusion, and finally, climate change and regenerative cities. One of the important things about these labs is that they overlap in, in terms of um, themes, expertise, and, and disciplines, so it's very transversal. Um, the, the action and the, the activity that I'm going to share with you today sits in the context of the sixth lab, the social innovation and inclusion one. Um, so one of the important things about the T-Factor project is why we use temporary urbanism as a tool for co-creation and in, in, in the co-production of, of um, resilient urban futures. Um, one of the key axioms of the project is that um, by enabling temporary uses, we are able to experiment and innovate in ways that in a more structured uh, and unflexible sort of planning um, strategy does not enable us to. Um, so one of the ways that we en enable the use of temporary uses is by understanding what makes them work and understanding what makes them successful. And so as you can see on the screen, uh, we have identified um, four um, critical elements that um, are found more or less in all of the conversations that have to do with temporary urbanism. One of them being uh, the collaboration model, which is the topic that um, uh, we helped address with Bilbao. So, oh, I don't know if, okay, there we go. Um, in the in the T-Factor project, we use the Quartable Helix Innovation Model as a guiding line to help pilots um, think about their governance models and the way that they co-create uh, these temporary uses and then by extension, how they co-create um, these re regeneration process and city making. Um, so in the case of Isla Sorotsaure, which is, as I mentioned, um, a very big regeneration project happening in Bilbao right now, um, some of the key topics and uh, priorities that they have is the development of a governance and management model that will help the stakeholders and the actors engaged in this regeneration uh, to build an ecosystem of companies, knowledge, and technological agents that will enable this regeneration um, site to transform into um, an innovation district that is um, oriented towards sustainability, innovation, and uh, knowledge-based. Um, the project itself, T-Factor, we, uh, in the activity that we had with them, we addressed uh, mainly the three points that you can see on the screen, sort of um, helping them think about uh, different collaboration models that might trigger um, the ability to tap into the potential of the different stakeholders uh, and address possible tensions and thinking about horizontal ways of governance that they can move forward with. Um, the um, process was fairly straightforward. We um, identified the stakeholder priorities. So what uh, Bilbao wanted to talk about, we engaged in dialogues with them to further understand what they needed and what they expected. And then we took this and ideated uh, activities to address these priorities, which we iterated until we ended up with um, a case study of collaborative uh, governance in which we delved into um, three different, no, two, two countries and then select cases in Europe where um, we explored uh, different uh, district management models. So we use Spain, Germany, and then um, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and the UK to help uh, the stakeholders in Bilbao get inspired about um, how their governance model might look like in the future. We specifically <clears throat> addressed um, uh, the models of business improvement districts, networks, and cooperatives. And the reason for this is the specifics of, of, of the network of actors that exist in Bilbao uh, lends itself 
to these sort of, of models, and we thought that it might be a very good way to spark the conversation. Um, specifically because one of the cities that we work with, Barcelona, also has a lot of experience with this. Um, they currently have um, adapted actually the BID model to fit their their uh, legislation and norm and and regulations. So we thought it it would be um, a very valuable um, first approach. Um, and so what we did with this case study was basically. Um, address a series of questions that the stakeholders needed to be answered, and we answered them in virtue of these examples. We um, then went and continued conversations with them, which then eventually led, um, they, they, they have been received by some of the stakeholders, namely policymakers that are involved in this process, and it has resulted um and that we have been able to plan for a policy making workshop in march uh which will kick start the development of the scholar collaborative go governance model for the island and then as a whole um uh on our side we continue to address the priorities uh, of the bilbao project which um namely summarize to them wanting to do this transition in a way that is oriented to um, um, sustainability and to really address these priorities that have to do with um, how to do better mobility, um, more inclusive education, more um, inclusive um, city making and things of the sort. And as a personal experience, I feel that um, we are very well on our way and I look forward to your comments and questions about it. I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, you can find more about the project on our website. And also, if you ever feel interested, let me know. <laughs> Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you very much for your offer, too. Um, without further ado, we will move to the third um, presentation, the novel evaluation method. So I give the word to, to Arash, the floor is you. Thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, I just quickly share my screen. And please let me know if you are able to see the slides. Okay, perfect. I got a hint from the background. Uh, so, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Arash Hajihani. I'm a senior scientist at uh, VTT Finland. Um, what transformative idea we have to share here in this conference is about the uh, novel evaluation metrics. And I have brought to you one experiment that we're doing under the project, uh, uh, which is about uh, identifying sustainable development goals in publication and patents where we have applied the machine learning uh, uh, approaches. So um, probably if I want to back a little bit and, and uh, provide a bit of a background to my arguments, uh, well, with the sustainable development goals is probably something that you, you are very familiar with. It's the agenda of, of the, the globe uh, towards the sustainable path. Um, we have science, technology, innovation as a main driver behind all the instances of productivity, let it be economic growth or prosperity in whatever sense. But uh, when we look at the literature and much of the activity, we realize that uh, there is a lot of effort and uh, focus around the research development, which is mainly translated to uh, job creation or firm performances or uh, in, in, in a very broad sense, like the gross domestic product. However, we are realizing that there is a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on uh, the global challenges such as climate, ch climate crisis. And these metrics are not really uh, translating what we are actually measuring. And in, in, in another sense, this has been turned to a productivity paradox where we are unable to capture uh, the productive essence of our economies because we are ignoring mainly the aspects about uh, sustainability. So this is the uh, 
ground we are putting a lot of work on to create novel metrics that can also capture the other aspects about our economies, particularly around the sustainable development uh, goals and the agenda, which is promoted on that, uh, uh, on that spectrum. So uh, the challenge is, as I said, um, we really need to adjust the aspects of economic governments and public policy in all levels to somehow reorient towards the SDG agenda. Uh, we know that SDGs are very uh, complex or, or also multidisciplinary and interlinked. It is also advised by many literature that it is not so that you focus on particular aspect and, and forget about the other. So they are all connected. So there needs to be a, a, a coherent and inclusive effort to uh, increase the qualities that we are, uh, we are looking forward in the SDG developments and the goals. Uh, but uh, in order to even start, we need to understand uh, what is categorized as SDG oriented and what is not. So to be uh, more precise, when we are measuring our uh, efforts uh, in, in a very global scale, like in, in a country scale, on the efforts of uh, publications or patenting, uh, we are now not very much focusing on how much of those artifacts, meaning publication patents or R&D efforts, are actually towards the SDGs. So uh, therefore, uh, we are now trying to uh, establish and create a proxy where we can uh, understand to what extent these um, instances are anyhow related to the SDGs and how far we are from them. So for that reason, uh, we have looked from the methodological perspective that how this has been uh, identified by the major sources like the United Nations material itself and the other organizations that are promoting uh, the and, and particularly defining the uh, SDGs. Uh, we realized that there is already some work done on uh, the affiliation of, for example, a publication, a scientific paper towards the SDGs. So there is kind of a work done there. But then you look at the other type of artifacts, for example, technology, uh, or, or patents uh, that has not been very much uh, research done. So then we realized, okay, probably uh, this would be a very interesting as avenue to, to consider. And we have utilized the machine learning approach. So in a sense that we learn from how we have been able to classify publications towards the SDGs, and then we extrapolate the exercise to understand uh, the relevancy of patents because patents are, uh, very technical in nature, they are very different from publications, and therefore uh, we, we decided to learn from publications and then apply the method on, on identifying the patterns re relevancy to the SDGs. Uh, the methodology is, uh, as you can see, we have started by learning the particular categories of SDGs by adopting the, the keywords, studying the the manuals from the United Nations or other literature, and then creating a lexical query that uh, give us a good response in, in let's say, um, indexing uh, websites like Scopus or Web of Science. And then by uh, collecting the publications on that ground regarding the SDG particular classes, we were able to create a training set for our machine learning model. So the essence of a machine learning approach is that you, you make the machine to learn from an examples and then you let the the machine to extrapolate the exercise and this was what exactly we did we made the classifier to learn from our training set and then we applied different type of documents this time patents to identify their relevancy and their closeness to the uh, sdg goals uh, we applied this for a sub sample of patents from a uh, european uh, patent office but first, we evaluated the classifier's performance and then uh, by using some um, um, kind of industry approved methods uh, like Python or the packages around that and the metrics we get for evaluating the kind of multi different classifier algorithms, we realized that uh, one of the um, uh, algorithms is performing better than others, which is called the word to reckon logistic regression. We get a um, um, acceptable accuracy for most of the SDG classes, not all, 
but then that's what we can get at the moment. Uh, this is always an iteratable process. We can improve this, but for now we took these forward and then we went to the exercise of identifying the patents regarding their relevancy. For the subsample of EPO patents we got for uh, roughly three years, 2017 to 2019, around 31,000 uh, patent families, we realized the distribution of the patents to the SDG classes. So now we can understand what is the proportion of the patents in, in, registered in the legislative of, of the EPO regarding the SDGs and how this is distributed. And then, uh, uh, for example, the other understanding we can get is, uh, um, as I said, where well, obviously the um, publications and patents classified in SDG1, there is a, a huge amount of similarity. But in another uh, perspective, you realize that there is a, a similarity between different SDG classes. And this actually uh, emphasizes the fact that uh, when we are looking at this uh, global problems and the way that is classified on the SDGs, it is not so that they are uh, in silos. They are all interconnected. Uh, there is um, interconnectivity between these uh, class classes, and uh, by by method and by design, we were able to see it on on, on the data. So uh, to be uh, conclusive and uh, just uh, conclude what we have done is. We really try to uh, promote another method to identify uh, SDGs on different type of artifacts. Uh, we try to offer a systematic path to create such a catalog. Uh, so I have a minute left uh, and, and this has been put into practice so we can see that how it, it looks like when we are applying to a certain subset of patents. Uh, but to conclude, uh, so this project was uh, funded from Business Finland uh, and uh, all the models and uh, are, are compiled under an API. So if you're willing to uh, utilize the models, you're very welcome to contact us or myself uh, so that uh, you can also experiment with the models in terms, in cases that you have uh, such case, cases like patents or publications. Uh, we would like to extend these capabilities uh, also to the externals. Uh, with that note, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Raj. And um, let me repeat my thanks to all the presenters to, for making my job redundant. I didn't have to uh, flag any five minutes to scold anybody for running over their time. That's always very pleasant and also means that would have um, 30 minutes for for discussion as it was initially planned. I would encourage everybody to leave questions on the chat as Diana Velasco has done. And uh, and we'll start with this one for the, Diana has another one. Okay, good. We'll go through Diana's questions in the chat. Uh, first one goes to the, to the T Factor project. Um, and she's asking what mechanisms have you used to keep the collaboration you are referring to going ongoing okay. yes um so while working with the pilot cities um there are mechanisms for dialogue in place um in, it's a very complex project because there's many people that are involved in each of the cities and so you have to make sure that you're always talking to the right person but the project itself has in place a mechanism where it's a little bit systematized in a way that if you as um as someone who is mentoring has a question or uh needs to follow up um you do go through a process to make sure that you land with the right person and then this eventually helps tighten the conversation on both ends to the to the point where this sort of bridging mechanism is not needed anymore. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, if, if that was along the lines what you wanted to know, Diana. But thanks for the question. Uh, I can, I can uh, maybe do a, a bit of a follow on on this. Um, when you, I mean, you mentioned at some point that you were developing the quadruple helix, so you were using the concept of quadruple helix. 
so how do you how do you see this concept? It's just a question of keeping actors from the different poles of the helix of the four different um, areas communicating, or you're thinking of this as a more I don't know deep or interactive model of working together, or just a means of constant communication. So um, each of the pilot cities um, has a different combination of these actors. So it really quite depends on what, who are we talking about. In the case of Bilbao, we are really um, starting with um, some stakeholders in the municipality. So that means we are starting from a very um, structured and governmental, so to speak, uh, perspective. Uh, we also have some of the stakeholders that ha were in the island before this process started. And some of them are um, their grassroots organizations, artistic uh, um, groups and things of the sort. So in a way, that's sort of the citizen, the citizen part. And what we were trying to do is um, helping the at least the municipality develop the um, an interest or to spark a, um, inspiration in how they can integrate the people that are already there uh, to eventually come to their own uh, understanding of this uh, quadruple helix, if that makes uh, any sense. Very good. Yes, um, we may return later to some aspects of your presentation. Diana keeps has more questions here, and this goes to you, Arash. I mean, the other time has flashed in the screen, um, but yes. um, there it is. Uh, thanks, Diana, for the question. Very interesting one. Uh, so technically, the challenge we're trying to solve is, is you know, kind of a, a let's say, a macro uh, problem that we have when you're talking about science, technology, and innovation, and, and, and it's, um, Kind of the uh, variables or methods to evaluate any activity, we realize that there is not uh, much about the relevancy of these uh, efforts towards the SDGs. If I want to give a concrete example, like when we are counting the number of publications for, let's say, uh, universities, or let's make it broader, like countries, and then making an assumption that country X is better than country Y because they have more volume of like high quality publication, whatever you want to call it. But so far, there hasn't been this uh, focus on to what extent these uh, scientific efforts are solving our global challenges. And if you look at the SDGs as the guidelines, we are trying to learn from them and here we are using these machine learning algorithms and the models there in order to identify to what extent these scientific efforts are actually related to the global challenges or let's say the SDGs in acronym. So your question about the qualitative data, I have to say in that scope is very, very limited. So it means that we need to know, for example, if a particular patent or publication to what let's say SDGs and by SDGs, it's like 17 categories, 170 uh, kind of a data problem. So an, an expert needs to understand to which of these categories this particular patent or publication is actually addressing. And so far, this resource is very limited. And then we have a problem to uh, actually identify from the qualitative methods that if such things exist. Although there, is, there are other methods that can replicate this, and then we, with machine learning model, we try to extrapolate that very limited training sets to, uh, to actually put it, put it into a model and then apply it to different cases, let it be uh, patent documents or uh, uh, R&D documents, or I mean, even uh, companies reports. So then you can identify to what extent they are actually addressing the SDGs. Uh, there was a follow-up question. Okay, that's for the last one. So I hope that my answer was uh, comprehensive enough. Thanks, Arash. Um, now let me go for the follow-up on, on what you just said. I mean, the way 
I mean, what your um, technique me method does is to select, isn't it, sets of articles or publications that are related to specific SDGs. And at one point, you made, I think you even use the, 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 the concept of identification, right? Identify relevant. But in the title, uh, you're talking about a metric. So how do you move from the identification of uh, pieces of text that are relevant to SDGs to the metric? Yeah. So in principle, yeah. You, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks for the question, Jordi. Uh, it helps me also to clarify. So uh, the identification will help us to understand if a pattern or publication is addressing to any of the SDGs. And then when you accumulate that data, then, for example, what the type of analysis we have done, then we can see that uh, in, in the Europe scale, which countries uh, promoting or addressing SDG 7 more than others. So then in, in a very practical way, you can see the distribution of particular publication towards the SDG. So if we have 17 SDGs, you can see a certain publication to what extent they are addressing or referring to a particular category. So then we have like, imagine like we have 17 more column of data for a publication that somehow captures the relatedness of that publication pattern to the SDGs. So in a way, the assumption there is the, the more publication in an SDG, the more you assume to have this country, for instance, involved in research on that, on that SDG. That's the kind of... Well, that, that could be some sort of an interpretation, yeah. Or at least the, the one way we prefer to interpret that is, uh, well, the efforts on a particular, let's say, country or, or country is probably a very big uh, uh, um, <laughs> volume of analysis here. We are now looking at uh, um, companies because they are actually doing the pattern thing. So we can identify if a particular sector within a country or a particular companies, if they are recognizing and addressing to the SDGs yeah. and to what extent that's the case. I mean, the, and I, I, I'll, I'll stop it here, but then I get pulled in this direction. The reason why I'm asking this is because, as you know, in, for instance, in bibliometrics, you have this issue of the different uh, patterns of publication in different dif uh, disciplines and different propensities to publish. If you transfer this to final of, of SDGs, for instance, one could make the argument that some SDGs are more related to a specific disciplines than others. Some SDGs will be very much supported by the social sciences and others will be supported by bio bi biological life sciences. So if you just do a straight comparison of publication numbers without waiting, then you could encounter the same problem as you do when you do bibliometrics, and you cannot do a straight comparison of numbers of publications and use it as an indicator of you know, intensity of research or capacity of research. Mm. Um, do you recognize this problem? Um, um, could I be right that it could be a potential problem? And, and if so, how do you address it? Yes, uh, definitely, and uh, that that indeed is a is a is a is a challenge with bibliometric as well. But uh, uh, what we are trying to do here is they are uh, actually creating this spectrum of relatedness. So it's not about if a publication falls into a category, yeah. we can assume that it falls, but then to what extent? Because there is a, a spectrum of importance within a, a particular SDG and there is a weighted system there. So then you can identify, you know, this um, the, the, the distribution and the spectrum of relatedness. And that probably, you know, captures the importance of, for example, a pattern of publication to an SDG, uh, kind of quantifies and gives another dimension of measure. Good. Good. Thank you very I much. A, uh, oh, Alejandra, please sorry. go ahead. I have a follow-up question um, in the context of the spectrum of relatedness. Um, do you account for the type of article or item that would sort of be self-proclaimed um, following or fulfilling uh, a particular SDG um, versus one that does not? Uh, well, 
technically what's happening here is that we are processing text. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems here we have, especially when we are looking at, for example, company reports, is that obviously they do a lot of uh, greenwashing, rainbow washing. So it's really difficult to really fact check. But uh, at the same time, we are trying to, you know, be more comprehensive in the sense that, you know, company reports or company websites is from one side, and then you have company uh, activities in patenting, which is more kind of uh, realistic in the sense that what they are doing. Or then if you want to extend further, you can go to the media outlet and, and, and understand what type of uh, you know, discussion is happening regarding a company, for example, in media regarding their activities. So this is more like a um, complex solution. We are trying to create indicators, but obviously one indicator is not going to be uh, explanatory. It needs to be combined with another signals so we can have a better understanding over, over the problem. So far, there has not been a, a, a bulletproof metric that really can guide us through if you know a particular company is doing uh, you know according or not according. But then you know the effort is to create as much as possible so we can have a better understanding. And this is one effort. And as I as I I, I was also very transparent in, in, in the presentation that uh, if you recall, we had a good response rate for some of the classes of the SDGs. But however, not for all the classes. So as you can see that still we are still in the, in the development phase and it needs time so we can be more uh, knowledgeable about detecting these things in, in the textual artifacts, for example. Right. It's really great work also because uh, from my end in, in urban planning studies, we are also thinking about this question to what extent do these projects or initiatives actually contribute to to the pursuit of the SDGs? So interesting work. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we have now we are now establishing a pattern by which Diana is asking a question in the chat and then I follow up with something um, else. So um, this one is um, for you at the end. Oh, yours. How do you define? Thank you, Diana. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Diana, for all your questions. <laughs> yeah, I would like to say that our work is not based just in terms of quantitative, quantitative indicators related to the number of projects, the number of patents, the number of not. We think that we are trying to be very um, and the node as a consortium of universities and research centers working together with companies, with people, with another universities in other parts of, of Chile. Uh, I think that maybe networks, but beyond networks is uh, collaborations, collaborations between uh, a community with a university, a university with another university, because there is a lack of collaboration uh, currently in, in Chile. So there is a, a lot of a, a cultural problem. We need to talk to people, we need to identify their, their needs, what they are dreaming about science, technology, and innovation. How can, and how can, with this gap, how can we relate it to the capacities in our universities or in our research centers? So there is a lot of, of a, I say, qualitative work or social capital dimensions that we need to identify with, with people, with companies, with public sector and of course with with companies so there is a, a lot of work to do uh, in this year to to move forward to have uh, an amount of different programs of, of projects research pro projects but we need to uh, to show the people to how how can science and innovation can improve the way of life and the quality of, of life of citizens so there is a, a lot of work related to more to be face to face with people. Thank you. Um, mine, I think it's a very logical objective. I think it's in context like Chile, Spain as well, which where I'm coming from, this question of the lack of articulation between different actors in the innovation system is very, very important. 
and that's what you are trying to address with your project. But um, in the conference, if you've been in the conference, you've probably heard of this kind of bedrock of a paper on which everything is built, the three frames, right? That you have a first frame that is innovation naturally follows research, and so if you don't worry too much about things, you put money in research, then you get innovation and impact and everybody's happy. Uh, the second one say, well, you can put money in research, but if you don't have a good interaction, a good connection between the actors, nothing may happen, so you have to um, focus on the interactions. And the third one is, well, something may happen, but it may be the wrong thing. You, so you have to focus on what kind of innovation you create. And in the present situation, it has to be transformative because to, say, to address the challenges we have in, ha in hand, we need a big change in the way the society works. So the three frames. When I read your document, your document seemed to me a very traditional, almost you know, exemplar of the second frame. It's about systems, it's about interactions, um, but I did not see that the, con the, the concept of transformation in the, in, in the socio-technical systems, for instance. Um, so that's why I was saying I'm going to push you a bit. Um, is your project transformative in the way of these three frames, the third frame, or you kind of acknowledge that, yeah, it's more systemic and that you don't see it as, you know, you are not really aiming for that kind of more social technical system transition that a lot of the literature and a lot some of the presentations in this conference have have addressed. Yes. Yeah, uh, but, but in, in our case, I would like to say that maybe the, the transformative perspective is how is how can we change the perception of people related to science and innovation? That, first of all, okay. the first thing. And with that, it's, a, it's a, something very subjective in, in our case. So mm -hmm. I think that if we want to transform it in the economy or the society, we, we need to talk to people and the perception of their, their, their own about mm -hmm. science and innovation, how, they, how can they perceive mm -hmm. it. And it's very important for us. Mm -hmm. why, why is the problem? Can you expand a bit? I mean, what's the wrong perception they have and how should the right perception be? I think that um, there, there is maybe with with the pandemic and, and all the, the, the things about the vaccines, people are more and more, um, they gave you more great value to, to science and innovation. Uh, that's a, a, a specific example. How can they learn uh, about the quality of life? how can science can improve their lives. Uh, so I think that in, in Chile is the, the way that we are trying to transform the people from, from this social perspective mm -hmm. beyond, the, beyond the technology of, of very economic or social development related to the society. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've taken out of this. Um, I think we still have five minutes. Um, we had quite a systematic approach of uh, questions by Diane and follow up by us and giving almost everybody a similar um, crack of the week, so to speak. If there are no more questions from the chat, then what I would ask is whether you have questions among yourself, like Alejandro question, Arash, or any comments to add. And, um, and when we are done through this, then I will close. So please go ahead. Anybody that may have any additional comment or question to one of your colleagues. Yeah, please. I would like to, to ask to Alejandra, how do you engage people in your T project, T lab project? Well, that's a question that we have ourselves as well, because we are primarily working with what we call local coalitions uh, in these pilot cities. So as we are 
mentoring through uh, urban regeneration process. That often means that we engage with municipality officers or with higher education institutions. Um, sometimes we are working also with um, uh, even consultancy firms. So um, it's not on the ground level yet because what we do is that we, we help these pilots uh, go through this process of engagement. And um, not in Bilbao, but I actually, um, I um, encourage you to look through some of the case studies that we have uh, published in the website. Um, some of them are very interesting in, in that regard. There are other pilots that, um, because of their different uh, priorities, they are approaching the subject in different ways. Um, some of them start from a very strategic point, as Bilbao does, and then some others are more, um, they are prioritizing um, engaging on other levels first. So um, they're very different stories for very different reasons. And um, it, they all have their, their nuances. But as the bottom line, this is something that, that we are working with. Um, it, it, it's a priority for us too, um, since these these processes tend to um, not intentionally, but they they do tend to have some um, unaccounted impacts when you when you um, think about uh, the integration of of the neighbors or the people that actually come in contact with these with these um, developments. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Alejandra. Thank you for Thank the you. question. Any other common question to Marisa? If there is anything else, I will um, drive this to a close, uh, like three minutes before our allocated time. I don't think anybody will complain for finishing three minutes earlier. And uh, I would also like to apologize to the presenters for my chaotic arrival to the room. Before anybody saw anything, you know, behind behind the screens, we had a little moment of panic as I arrived late and I have problems again with my um, with my sound system. So I apologize to you for uh, my chaotic arrival, but I think everything ended up all is well that ends well. So I'll thank you all for a very interesting set of presentations. And I'll thank you also for your efforts in your own areas of work and research. And with this, um, I guess just reminds to say goodbye. And see you around and the rest uh, of the sessions we have in this conference. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.